Yeah. Well, uh, welcome to the show anyway, Ash. Good to be here, good to call through. In lockdown especially, hey, keeps us productive, keeps us busy. Exactly. I've, I've, I've recorded more podcasts in the last three weeks than I have in months, man. So. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, um, makes sense. I want, to, I want to dig into, you know, your three biggest missions and talk about mental traits, mentality and things like that. But just to set mm. the scene for everyone, could you just briefly, you know, explain those three missions and um, really set the scene before we dive into them? Yeah, sure. So the three uh, world first records that I, that I set, first one was in 2014 when I became the first recorded person to walk solo and unsupported across Mongolia. That was the 78 day journey. It took, uh, it covered 1,500 miles worth of land. It was three weeks over the Altai Mountains, five weeks across the Gobi Desert, and a further three weeks through the Mongolian steppe. Uh, and because it was so alone and unsupported, it meant that I'd need to carry everything in order to survive, which is not possible to carry just a rucksack covering that massive land. So I had to take a trailer weighing 18 stone um, or 120 kilograms, which is pretty much the same weight as uh, Anthony Joshua. <laughs> which was which was killing me um but you know it, it had everything that i needed to survive um the next one was madagascar and so that was a world first and become the first person to walk the entire length of the island via its interior from south to north and summit in the eight highest mountains along the way now that was only 100 miles longer than mongolia but almost doubled the duration so it was 1600 miles and it took 155 days to complete. And then the most recent one was Mission Yangtze, and that was my most ambitious. Uh, that was a 4,000 mile journey, and it took me 352 days, and that was to become the first person to walk the entire, entire length of the Yangtze River, the longest river to run through the single nation, and third longest river in the world. Now, I think the question you get asked more than any is why? And why? what makes me... <laughs> want to know that is obviously we come from we're both from wales we come from a similar background i know this place and i know you know no one's really you've gone on the lock up to in in, in certain regards no one's no one's going to take you to um to become an adventurous person do you know what i mean it's very working class background so without you know you coming from a place like this and you're similar age to me where did you get the motivation from yeah man you know it it just it all happened by random to be honest um you know i was just in my my school down the road my local high school i come from a normal background no financial background no military background um no university degree to my name either you know i went straight from high school and i went into into college i was always very sporty in high school you know very competitive um and loved the community of friends that i had all the banter and whatnot again normal guy and then I went on to college to do an outdoor education. It was probably this course that made me realize that I was far more um, of a kinesthetic learner, you know, hands-on practical work. I couldn't really sit still in the classroom and listen to other people telling me about their experiences. I, I would prefer to go out experience, even if it meant me making mistakes, I would always learn that way. Um, and then, you know, midway through that two year diploma college course, I just, whilst I felt like I was the only one not going to university, the rest of the students, they were going to Liverpool or Manchester or Bangor or whatever university. Um, and I was just like, man, I still didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really know, you know, I knew that I didn't want to be an outdoor instructor. I didn't want to go to university. Um, but I, I very quickly realised that I did want to travel. You know, I wanted to get out there. I wanted to gain real life experience. I wanted to develop myself in all areas. Uh, not just to learn about the world and traditions, cultures, but to learn about myself, to, you know, I'd be developing my maths because I would be handling different currencies. I'd be de developing my English because I'd now be setting up professional uh, emails. So I'd just be push pushing myself out there in the deep end. Um, but again, what at that time I was working, I was working in a fish and chip shop. I then went on to work as a waiter. So I was working as a waiter on a few pound an hour. Um, I just didn't know how I was going to possibly make these world travels happen. I'd never boarded a plane on my own. I'd never gone to Asia before. Um, but I created this mind map. I remember telling my dad and he helped uh, in terms of, you know, to, to what goals I needed to tackle. And it's like vaccinations, insurance. So, yeah, we just put, I put a plan together. I sold my car. Um, I found work as a lifeguard in Clandidno. 
and I was working 240 hours a, a month. I would wake up every morning and I'd see the world map on my wall with photos of destinations I was trying to get to, normally ripped out of magazines and quotes to help me stay on track. And for the next two years, I was just grinding away, um, working to save the pennies to, to travel. And so that's where, you know, and, and yeah, so I say that's where the motivation came from. It was from the sports onto learning through experience onto having this curiosity and wanting to throw myself in the deep, deep end and develop myself through travel. Do you think that if it wasn't, you know, um, adventure and expedition you went down, do you think you always had that in you to, to go down an unconventional route to challenge the status quo, not to follow the conventional path we, we're taught in school as, you know, go through school to get grades, to go to, to go to university, to get other grades, to get a job, do you know what I mean? Did you, did you always yeah, have that's that a great in question, you? actually. Yeah, no, that, I, I don't think I've been asked that one before. And I think you're right. I think I probably would. Um, I just, I could never see myself. I don't know. I couldn't see myself settling down. I also couldn't see myself being based in, in the UK for my early 20s. You know, I, I, yeah, there was just, there was just something itch and I don't know what it was. It was probably other people's stories. It was probably realizing that it is a big world and there's so much opportunity. I don't mean to, to just to travel and to take on these adventures. I just mean, you know what it's like, you know, typical, typical school, you'll have like the certain jobs that the teachers will talk about, but you realize that there's millions of jobs that you never even heard of. There's thousands of ways or millions of ways that you can earn money that you're not taught in school, you know? It, it just isn't a thing. Uh, and I did know that that was out there. And I knew that travel would broaden my mind to make me realize that, whoa, hang on. Like what I'm doing now, I, I, you know, if I told my career's advisor or whoever, like, yeah, I want to be an extreme athlete or an adventurer when I'm older, you know, that's just, just ridiculous, isn't it? Sit down, Nash, what are you talking about? <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I definitely would say that I was always driven in that sort of, in that sort of way. Initially, I was just looking to maybe become a snowboarding or skiing instructor and a scuba diving instructor, and then I can jump around with the seasons, maybe work in, in Canada as a snowboard instructor. And then when the season's over, I can go to somewhere in Asia or the Caribbean as a scuba diver. So that was my initial plan. At age 16, I had that idea. Um, but yeah, things evolve, don't they? Things always change. Yeah, I mean, what... I mean, there's, there's traveling and then there's, there's what you do. I mean, when I wanted a sense of travel, I did the Mount Everest base camp and, and you know, that was enough for me, but nice. for Where you, you that? Um, last March, yeah, yeah last, last cool, March man. was really good. And, and that was, that was more than enough for me and I got my fix there. But for you, what is it about that sense of innovation, that sense of true adventure, that sense of danger, even that you, you must've been craving to just not follow, you know, a conventional traveler's plan? Yeah, you know, um, it was that sense of freedom. It was that sense of experiencing things off the beaten track. It was the sense of soaking up the, the real way of the country with the locals, you know, their tradition, their, their food, their culture, their way of life. Um, and, you know, a perfect example is when I, when I first left uh, Wales and went over to China was my first destination. I was age 19. Uh, with my friend and you know we were doing the typical tourist route chucking the great wall we were on the on the beaten track we didn't really have our own stories experiences um that any other traveler doesn't have you know when they travel if they go to china it's of course the great wall of china um and when we went down to southeast asia i remember me and my friend pretty much sulking you know on the mekong riverbank in cambodia just saying like we've not really taken on any you know any adventures like we said we would like we've experienced a lot of cool things, but nothing unique. Um, and we've, we've got the currency wrong. <laughs> and we've dipped into our funds way more than we anticipated. And I suggested to her, I was like, okay, so we need to, we need to go cheaper because we were on a shoestring budget. It was ridiculous. So we needed to uh, go low budget and we wanted adventure. So I just suggested to my friend right there and then, you know, how about we get the most ridiculous looking bicycles we can and, I don't know, look, man, let's cycle out of Cambodia and the entire length of Vietnam. And that was probably just that phrase alone was the Kickstarter, maybe to this whole adventure career. He sort of laughed and he said, you know, sounds good. You know, what bikes? And as he said that, there was an old lady cycling behind. The bike was rusted. It was making all sorts of screeching noises. It looked ridiculous, you know, but it looked affordable. 
So I turned around and I said, those, we purchased those bikes and off we go. And literally that day or the following day, we did, we spent 10 pounds on a bicycle um, each, uh, two pound 50, I think it was each on a tent that wasn't waterproof. We had no gears on our bike, no suspension. We found string on the side of the road that we used to strap our rucksack onto the back. We had a little uh, pink bell, a basket on the front. We didn't have a map. We didn't have, we didn't have anything, man. It was ridiculous. And we were about to cycle over 1,130 miles. And despite the bikes breaking 30 to, uh, 17 times, despite um, being chased by dogs, almost hit down by lorries, dodged by mopeds, cycling up mountains and having the pedals fall off. There was something about that adventure, you know, when you're looking at the tourists go by, go by on, the, on the big coach and they're watching a movie and missing out on all the beauty of this land that you're cycling over. And you're like, wow, we're doing it the proper way and we're stopping and resting with locals. There's just no conversation at all because of the language barrier. There was just something super special about that. And what kept us motivated on that journey was the fact that once we get to the end, we'll be able to say for the rest of our, our life that we cycled the entire length of Cambodia and Vietnam. And so there was something, something about that that I really loved. And the Vietnam, I would say, was then the Kickstarter, probably to the, uh, not to the adventure career, because yeah, I wasn't earning, I wasn't even sharing stories. It was just for the pure passion and love. Mm. But um, Kickstarter to where I found my niche, I found my passion. When you when you took that next step then and you set your sights on Mongolia, you mentioned that you you didn't have a gym at the time and you did all your training in your garden, and especially yeah. for something someone's never done before, how did you go about training? How did you even know how to train for it? Yeah, man, that was scary. Mongolia was was a scary journey. That I didn't really know how to properly train. I would I would just. I would just get out there. Um, so yeah, you know, after all of those adventures, cycling in Vietnam, learning how to survive in the jungle with the Burmese hill tribe, adventures across Southeast Asia, Australia, I was then working and living in Thailand as a master scuba diver instructor and Muay Thai fighter. And it was within those two years of living out in Thailand that I thought, this is great, but I'm missing all of the previous adventures. You know, scuba diving's become a job, I've become used to it. Um, and so, yeah, Mongolia popped to mind as that extreme country that no one really knows much about and very unfamiliar with. We started to do extensive research. Um, we couldn't find any evidence to suggest that anyone had completed the journey so long and support. I wasn't in it for the record. But then I realized once I got teams on board in the US and the UK and Mongolia, and we realized that if I complete it, this could be a world record. I couldn't do what I did with Vietnam, you know, it needed to be proper training, proper preparation, because it was life and death, not a matter of winning or losing. Um, but we did find someone who had attempted, and he had attempted three times. Uh, he was uh, evacuated on all three occasions, unfortunately. I think it was just before or just after the halfway point. Um, and I wrote to him, and he was a good guy. He replied, I asked him the dangers, and he pretty much said, you've got to watch out for the, for the gray wolves, the drunk, the, the drunken nomadic drifters, the stagnant water, the snow blizzards, the sandstorms, and the list went on. And so that's why I had a lot of fear with Mongolia, you know. Um, and when I looked into the sky, I realized he was a Navy soldier, a desert explorer, and I was just a 21-year-old living on the beach <laughs> who had never been to the desert before, you know. But I came back here. I moved back home with my parents. I didn't have much in my, uh, in my account. I had my uncle drop me off a tractor tire. I bought a, a sledgehammer from my local Sturmat. And I was really starting to flip the tire, beating it with a sledgehammer. I was trying to build up uh, inner core strength and durability. I was doing a lot of calisthenics work. I walked the length of Wales along the office dike uh, in the depths of winter, just before Christmas, I think that was, um, to test kit. And yeah, you know, preparation. I was just making myself, you know, I, I'm a big believer in that saying, the more uncomfortable you make yourself, the more comfortable you become. And so I was just throwing myself out there, 5, 6 a.m. in the rain. You know what it's like here in Wales. It's pretty grim weather, hardcore conditions. Um, but I knew that I wouldn't have that option in Mongolia. So I was, I was mentally training because I do believe it's 70% mindset, 30% physical. I was expecting the worst case scenarios. If there's going to be wolves, expect to be attacked. If there's going to be blizzards, expect them to be the biggest and the baddest. Um, not because I wanted to face the biggest, but... Just that mental preparation, you know, um, if it did happen and I was to face the worst case, at least I, it wouldn't take me by shock or by surprise. I'd be mentally prepared for it. Yeah, that was the next question I had was um, 
how you combat that sense of fear. You mentioned, you know, wolves, blizzard, uh, sandstorm, snakes, wild dogs. Was there a case of just visualizing the worst case scenario at all points and, and say, you know, thinking of the extreme? Yeah, you know, I, I have something where I always try to, to terrify myself and think of the worst case scenario um, and overplay it in my head. You know, I remember waking up before I attempted the journey with nightmares, you know, nightmares that there were a pack of wolves surrounding my tent and I was alone just inside my tent with a, a knife in one hand, a torch and the other type of thing. I would just scare myself. And now I do that, you know, it helps so much that, that I do that to people wanting to join me on an expedition. I really want people to join me, but I tell them worst case scenario first, the dangers that can go wrong. And if they choose not to come, then they've made the right choice because when they face those dangers, they wouldn't be ready for it. But if they know worst case scenario and they still decide to come along, then it doesn't fall in my responsibility. They know what they're getting themselves in for. They know what can go wrong. They've overplayed it in their head. So hopefully they can, they can tackle through it. Um, so, yeah, I just always terrify myself. Think of worst case scenario. Because if you think of us as a people, if something happens to us that we weren't expecting, that's where we, we panic, you know, where we scream or where we do that shock of capture almost. But if something happens and you knew it was coming and you were expecting it, you know, there's no need to panic. You just crack on and, and hopefully you can, you can tackle through it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, when I watched uh, one of the videos on your website, when, you were, when mm. you were talking about this journey, is you mentioned that there was a point where you were four days away from your next water supply. Now, mm. with, with the dangers of, you know, blizzards and sandstorms, these are all things you can see. But, you know, w w when, you're in a, when you know that it's going to be four days and something such as water, something so dangerous, how does, how does that affect you mentally? Where does that take you? Yeah, so with the, the Gobi Desert, so that was five weeks that it took to cross the, the Gobi. So there was a time um, that you're talking about now where, I was running low on water. So I carried a big 20 liter, 20 kilogram container full of water. Um, but that I was going through pretty rapidly. And me and my logistics manager who helped me plan it, who knows the journey, uh, the, um, the country extens extensively, we would always go by confirmed water sources and unconfirmed water sources. So if I was coming across an unconfirmed water source, I would always try to carry enough water to last me through the unconfirmed mm. to get to the confirmed. Um, but I'd gone through quite a lot and then we had, I'd gone deeper into the Gobi Desert, further down south. And by the time that I reached that unconfirmed water source, I was already very low on water. And that was the danger. But at this point, I was already weeks into the Gobi Desert and I was delirious, I was hallucinating, uh, I was in agony. I could almost feel my organs drying up at my worst case, uh, at my worst point. Um, but I, again, it was one of those I had, to, I chose to push on actually from the unconfirmed to the confirmed, it was more than four days, but I, I went on and on, I say four days, probably from my worst point. Um, I was pushing on, I was, it was 40 degrees Celsius plus there was no breeze. There was no natural shelter. The tires kept sinking into the soft sand, which made it feel like I was pulling a concrete block through hell. My only shade I could hide was to hide underneath my trailer. And it was that point, it was that sense of realization, I would say that shit, you know, if I, if I don't keep getting up from out of this trail and pushing on, I'm going to die out here in the Gobi Desert. At this point, because this was fairly low budget expedition too, I didn't have the evacuation plan like the previous guy. No helicopter was going to take me out of there. Uh, my only means of uh, pickup was to text my agent in the capital city, Ulaanbaatar, uh, and to rely on him to find me within four days. That's how long it would take. But then it would take another two days to get me out. So it was potentially six days. Or at this point, which is my worst point, I've got four days of walking. And I didn't believe I could survive longer than four days, to be honest. And so the backup option wasn't an option. And now my only option was to walk myself out. And so, to, so for my mental, what I chose to do is because I just couldn't visualize four days. I was just in too much agony. Um... It was a hell of a hell of a long time, but what I chose to visualize was 100 meters. I chose to bro break my goals down. I've always broken my goals down, but this is an example of how it's actually saved my life. You know, I could see 100 meters, 
So I chose to walk 100 meters and to rest under my trailer no more than five minutes because sometimes I can be under the trailer for an hour and then take on another 100 meters and then rest for five minutes. And by, by doing this, as painful and as slow as it was, I was making progress uh, and I did just about make it to that community in a bad, bad way. It took me eight days to recover, um, but lived to tell the tale. <laughs> I know. I'm, I mean, some of the, the physical, uh, we've talked about the mental, but let's talk physical. I mean, you, you mentioned the 120 kg uh, supplies trailer you're pulling. I think the fact mm. that in a situation which you were, you, you can't escape the elements. You can't, you, that's not in your circle of, of control. Um, and that must, that, must be, that must take you to a frustrating place as well, I imagine. Yeah, it, does, it really did. Um, I was flipping, I was yelling for the times that I had energy, then I slipped into a place where I didn't even have that energy to be shouting or screaming. You know, I went through everything. Um, it was horrific, really. It was horrific. And I'm normally a really positive guy. I can easily forget the negatives and that's probably my problem. And that's why I go on to do bigger and better expeditions because I only remember the positives. But no, when I do slip back into that, I, it was almost that each step was each step was so painful. I was a lot skinnier. You know, I'd just been pulling the trail all over the mountains for three weeks. And now I had five weeks of the Gobi Desert. I went over eight days at one point without seeing a single human. Um, and the, the sun was relentless, just constantly beating down. You know, I remember my head throbbing. Everything was just out of sync. My body, I was delirious. Yeah, it was hideous. It was hideous. So that's why physical does play a key part as well. Um, you can you can die so fast with with heat stroke. Um, but yeah, you know, break the goals down, keep going. <laughs> One of the the things that um, I I I picked up on, and I don't think many people would have thought about this, is the mm -hmm. fact that you you had this task to deal with, but also at the same time you were filming yourself. You were you were vlogging. Now, yeah. you've got a million more priorities to deal with than that. So I imagine just that must have been a lot of effort as well. Just thinking, you know, you've got this massive task at hand and then you're thinking, I got to film this as well. I got I to do a vlog. And you always manage to, to stay positive in the vlogs as well, which I thought was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think the, uh, I don't think some of the footage has been released <laughs> the section that I'm actually in the Gobi Desert, like really under my trailer and really in a bad way. I remember I, looking back on that footage once I had finished the expedition and just thinking, man, that is dark. That is dark. I don't know if we can, if we can release that. So there were definitely times that I was, <laughs> well, I was down and out for sure. But, um, but yeah, you know, and that's also, that's also an, an, an issue as well. That's also a problem. Like it's all good being positive. I remember my speaking agent, um, contacted me when I was in Madagascar and he was like, you know, you're making it look easy. No one's really getting the essence of how difficult this is. You're talking about how difficult it is, but you're talking with a smile on your face, you know, so people won't really relate. They won't really get that. Um, and that is my problem, but that's probably because, you know, you need sense of humor in a time like that. You need to be able to laugh at yourself because You'll be crying at yourself if you don't laugh. You know what I mean? You've got to just find that sense of humor. Remain positive um, because it's that positivity and humor that gets you through. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes I, I just laugh at the ridiculousness of, of the journey. Sometimes there's one where I'm in the Gobi Desert, just leaning against my tray and eating an apple with a knife. Yeah, just, like, just shaking my head laughing because my lips are blistered. That's why I had to use the apple. Um, you know, because in the morning I would wake up and I would have to, I'd have to ply my lips open because the altitude and the cold, my lips would blister and puffs and scab up together. Um, and I would remember drinking from the ration pack and putting it back down and be, there'd be a flow of puffs and blood into my porridge. Um, so that's why I'm shaking my head because I'm just eating with this apple because I can't open my mouth to bite it. So I went to eat with the knife and I'm just like, this is, this is ridiculous. I've still got another, another eight weeks to go. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's actually the video I was referring to. I was watching on your YouTube channel this morning and the, <laughs> I got you. the way you were smiling. Like, I, yeah. I imagine as well that like you, you're out there on your own. There's, there's, you said there's no backup. You, you have to phone and, and hope they can find you. I imagine yeah, that... I couldn't even phone. It was literally text only. Oh, I, wow. it, the satellite phone was awful. It was, I could only text and it took about 10 minutes 
just to write help me <laughs> I am like I imagine you know you're you're alone for for that long and and I assume you have to sort of become your own best friend. What's the what's the self talk like? Yeah, um, yeah, that's an interesting one. You know, music helped me a lot. I would listen to music a lot. Um, the self talk. I found that I was very positive, upbeat, day by day. In fact, on my journey in Madagascar, I was with. I was with people and I found that actually uh, I'm very good at working with a team as I am solo, but working with a team, as you know yourself, you know, other people's mood can affect yours. And if I'm alone, my mood tends to slip towards the positive side anyway. If I'm with a team and their mood isn't slipping towards the positive, not only do I have to pick myself up, but I've got to pick them up, which, which exerts you even more mentally, you know? So it is interesting. So in Mongolia, I do remember remaining and feeling positive a lot of the time because each day that I'd finish, I didn't, I didn't think of how long I had left to go. I thought of how much closer I am to that finish line than the start line, you know? Um, so the self-talk was, you know, there was, there was one point actually when I was back here before I attempted Mongolia, I just knew that I, I, I didn't really know how capable I was. I didn't know how I'd react to any certain situations. And what scared me the most is I might quit and I might give up on my Mongolia journey because I had never faced something this big ever before. Um, and so I actually sat down and I sent a voice memo whilst I'm in my house, whilst I'm, I've got a, a belly full of tea, full of food, whilst I'm feeling positive, I'm warm and comfortable. I sent a voice note and I told myself that I would, nev I would I never listen to that voice note unless I am in a really dark place in Mongolia. Um, and I did, it, that was in the Gobi Desert on that stint. I listened to that voice note and it was sort of like positive ash sending a, a message to struggling and negative ash. Um, so that was a technique. I don't think anyone ever really told me about. I, it's just I do remember feeling upbeat and excited to take on Mongolia. I equally knew that I would be thinking differently once I am taken on Mongolia. And I'm in the elements and I'm feeling vulnerable and alone and scared and hungry. Um, that I would need that reminder of why I started this and what would happen if I achieve it compared to what would happen if I don't achieve it. So I'd set up a very brutal voice note to myself that I only ever listened to once. Wow. I mean, <laughs> have you ever thought of releasing the, the audio from that voice note? Uh, I, I haven't actually. No, no. It would be very interesting. Um, to I'm sure to I've it. still got it somewhere. <laughs> um, moving on then in, into, into Madagascar, what, what were some of the, the different obstacles you faced out there? I mean, what were, were there, was there a new threat you, you dealt with out there? Yeah, man, I tell you what, Madagascar was insane. I think people see Madagascar as the smaller mission, but make mo no mistake, it was definitely the, the bigger expedition. Um, it's the fourth largest island in the world. And obviously, you know, I said it's only 100 miles longer than Mongolia with the route that I took, but it took 155 days compared to 78 days. It was just challenge after challenge. There was no letting up. There was never really a pleasant day's trek. You know, it's never just finishing the day. That was a nice day's walk. Not one day of the 155 was ever like that um but i loved it you know i was attracted to the country 90 percent of all plant life and wildlife found in madagascar it's found nowhere else in the world uh, again you know like with Mo mongolia i always tie in the reason i never like it to be just about myself and the journey i'm always trying to give back and help where i can so i was raising funds for the red cross who protect who helped to protect the nomads and raising awareness for climate change and the effects it has on the nomads um, with Madagascar, I partnered up with the tourism, I partnered with the Leeward Network Conservation. So the aim was to walk the entire length, some at the mountains, but drop down to these different organizations and help to promote all the amazing work that they're doing to, to protect and, the, and preserve the unique biodiversity. But Madagascar, um, I was held up at gunpoint by the military. Um, I came across bandits. I actually tried to hide from the bandits by using the jungle. And I realized the bandits are using the jungle to hide from the military. So we had to escape the jungle and bump into the military. Um, it was like Rambo shit. It was crazy. <laughs> um, and then I caught malaria uh, only one month into the five month journey. Um, I had to again, I had to walk with malaria for a good number of days. 
um, until I reached a community that had overland transport and I managed to get to medical services. The doctor believes only a few hours before slipping into a coma. So that was a scary one. So unfortunately, I contracted it, but fortunately, which sounds a bit weird, it was the deadliest strain. There's four strains. Uh, the three lower ones can remain dormant in your system forever, but the deadliest strain, it usually kills you within 24 hours. But if you manage to catch it in time, you can eradicate it completely out of your system. Um, so I don't have malaria in my system, no places whatsoever, which is great. Uh, it took me about eight days again to recover from that. I lost 13 kilograms of weight. Uh, it knocked my confidence. It knocked my mindset. It knocked my physical abilities. But, you know, I, I trained up in the room. I tried to put that weight back on, uh, get my mental courage back, pushed on. The mountains were brutal. You know, there wasn't many locals up there. Some locals would run from us. Some had never seen Westerners before. It was insane. Um, a lot of the time, but nobody goes up there. So it's just hacking through the jungle, machete in hand sort of creating our own path, sometimes hunting, gathering, facing the cyclone season where the leeches would fall from the tree or the spiders down on top. And like just for a grim example, we take our top off at night to get a good night's sleep and we'd have to ply six to seven different leeches off and flick them out of the tent. Um, and yeah, man, it was, just, <laughs> it was just challenge after challenge. And of course, Gertrude the chicken, um, who brightened things up a little bit, but uh, even he was a bloody challenge, squirking in my ear constantly, non-stop when I'm hungry and frustrated. <laughs> Am I right in thinking there was eight summits along the way? Or? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So Madagascar has like a mountainous range, pretty much that runs the whole length of the island, uh, central east, and so he was my logistics manager in Madagascar. He's, he's at the face of adventure, he's led, Discovery Channel, Nat Geo on different um, exploits to far corners of Madagascar. And pretty much he said, there's been two people who have walked the coast. Uh, and he said, but you've got beaches, you've got people, you've got food, you've got fresh water. It's not harsh environment. You've got no dangerous wildlife, he says, however. And it was just that however that got me. He said, there, are, there is a mountainous range in Madagascar that lies the entire length. And that's never been, you know, he had to do all of his research and he says it's recorded, it's, no one's ever been recorded to actually take on that, that whole ridge. And then I just threw in that challenge of summit to the eight highest mountains to make sure that I stay on the, on the ridge. I was regretting it at the time. But um, so that was it. He pretty much set me that challenge and I was like, the mountain is rigid is. He said, it's harsher, you've got less water, you've got less food, you've got less population. Um, and he, he did warn, he says, you'll come across communities that are still suffering with the bubonic plague. You'll come across communities, some of which have never seen a Westerner before, that will literally scatter and abandon their village uh, and hide in the bush when you approach. And I experienced all of it. It was, it was insane. You think maybe Papua New Guinea or Amazon, yeah, but you don't think of that. Madagascar, you know? Um, incredible place. I was looking at the, the promo video for it on your website and you said, um, will I make it? I have to. Now, what, why, why, did you, why did you have to? Was it because of what you put into it? Was it because of the charity work that was going along with it? Did you feel responsible? Yeah, um, a mix of things, really. I felt like I had, you know, I like to believe that I'm a man of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll, I'll get the job done. Um, secondly, I didn't want to come back and have people pat me on the shoulder. Oh, well done, you tried your best. Don't like that. Uh, <laughs> third, um, yet third, I knew what I was getting myself into. You know, I, I volunteered. It, it wouldn't come as a shock. I knew what the challenges would be. I knew there was a chance of potentially catching malaria. It's all about seeing what challenges and obstacles there are and not going for it until I feel 100% confident that I can overcome each of these challenges and obstacles, because then it is just reckless. Then it is just daredevil stuff. You know, I don't see what I do as daredevil stuff. I see it as meticulous planning, uh, risk assessments in place, um, but things can go wrong. It is an adventure. So, um, but yeah, probably just a bit of stubbornness as well, you know, have wanted to, wanted to complete it. But in, I think the, the quote that you saw that, that was probably off my Mongolia promo. So the fact that I said that, will I survive? I have to, um, because I didn't have any other choice. It was either keep getting up out of the trailer and walking to complete it, to get out of that Gobi or die. So almost like I only had that option. 
that was my only option. <laughs> wow. um, after the Madagascar um, expedition, am I right in thinking mm. you were announced as the, the UK ambassador for Madagascar tourism after that? Yeah, yeah, which was an honor. Um, we reached around 350 million people worldwide. Wow. There was TED Talks, there was UK theater tours. We were able to launch the book Mission Possible. Uh, there was 10 Downing Street getting involved. And then, yeah, Madagascar called me back to the island, uh, met up with the minister and they announced me. Um, yeah, UK ambassador for, for the country of tourism, which was amazing. So this is when it all started. To, so that's why I say like Vietnam was the catalyst in terms of to find my niche, my passion. But I'd say Mongolia and Madagascar were that realization that, wow, you know, I can, I can do, do what I love, do what I'm passionate about as a, as a career, but also with a good motive, with good cause. I like to call it how my, how my friend of mine does. It's sort of explore to conserve. And, you know, you're partnering up with these environmentalists, these conservationists, who are the real unsung heroes, you know, that I'm trying to shine the light on them and what they do in a positive way, uh, rather, rather than like a negative way, which a lot of news now is just all, all quite negative, isn't it? So, uh, and they obviously, overlook the people who are volunteering working their best to protect the, the wildlife and the environment so yeah all of this hand in hand that was it that was a, a great honor it's uh, crazy what the adventures bring and i was able to then partner with malaria no more uk having caught malaria and almost died from it myself i was able to be a voice for those who suffer with it i was able to to go into westminster i was able to uh present to the to the uk government to demand an increase in funds to the global fund to help save over 8 million lives within the next five years. And as a joint effort of all of our stories mix and the whole malaria number one UK, we, we were successful. So, um, which makes it all worth it. I take malaria again, knowing that I could help be a voice and help potentially save others who play that small part, you know? Yeah. Amazing. And, um, you then, uh, you've already taken that jump. You took an even bigger jump, um, taking on in China. Um, yeah. And I know there were some there were some problems at the at the start of that um, mm. journey. And what did those problems do in the sense that you know you you geared yourself up for this for this mission? Did it affect or alter the mindset? Was it demoralizing? At, you know, you were just about to start. Was it was it demoralizing to your to your mindset when taking her on? For many things, yeah, it was demoralizing. Um, it was also serious in in a way that. The longer we left it, the more jeopardy I'd be put in, not only the expedition, but, but my life as well. Mm. Um, we were already two months delayed from starting because of sensitivities and getting permits and stuff. Um, and then once my you know, film crew and guide there to come off the mountain due to altitude sickness, that delayed me another two weeks. So that's now two and a half months. And so I knew at this point I was going to face minus 20 degrees Celsius up on the mountains at over 5,100 meters. Um, and a lot of my team in China and the UK were pretty much trying to get me to abort it, you know, forget about it this year, let's, let's try again next year. Um, I just couldn't fathom that. I couldn't, that's something I couldn't do. I put too much energy, too much effort. Uh, it took over two years to plan this Yangtze journey because logistically it was, a, it was a nightmare. It was a fun challenge, but it was so demanding and difficult. Uh, and I believed that we could, yeah, if I, if I started after the two and a half month delay, if I cracked on straight away, I would now need to pick up my pace. And I'll tell you why it was more serious and dangerous. It was the fact that I would be now facing minus 20, but any more delays that happen, which there were f further delays by the police, um, I would then potentially have to walk in minus 40 degrees Celsius on the plateau whilst winter's on this way. Not only that, but now the bears are coming off the mountains because it's too cold. They're coming down, they're looking for food, for calories before they go into hibernation for the season. We were walking calories, you know. Um, same with the wolves. The wolves were more active now. Uh, and just everything was against us. There would be more landslides because it would be sensitive. There'd be more snowfall. The, uh, the river would be higher, so the tributaries would be more difficult to cross. So all of this was just alerting my team. And that's why they were like calling me up from Beijing or calling me up here from Wales or London saying, Look, just just call it off. Try again next year. But um, again, we believed in the preparation. We, we cracked on. We upped our pace, and we tried to get off the mountains uh, as quick as we as quick as we could. 
you mentioned the um the biggest threat being you know bears and and um you mentioned at one point you were followed by by a pack of wolves and um you spoke to a local who you didn't find out till later but a lady had, had been killed by wolves a day before um how how real was that threat and, and did you see it as a as as the threat it was at the time or was it not until late that you realized fucking hell like I just... yeah not until later really you know the wolves sort of the wolves it's quite a risk for them to go after a person you know they're mm. they're too busy hunting down a much smaller prey um and i wasn't particularly worried about the wolves in china because they're not great wolves the wolves yeah. in mongolia was because they're the big ones but um and so, yeah, we didn't know what these Tibetans were saying, but Kyle, my videographer, who's fluent in China, but not Tibetan, um, he filmed all of the talk, and we didn't really know what they were saying. Anyway, we said, you know, thank you, bye. And we carried on walking down that valley that they kept pointing to. And then it was only about, it was about six months later that my editing team in Beijing um, were going through the footage, and, and she contacted me saying, you have no idea what he was saying, but he was pretty much pointing down the valley. And he was warning us against it. He was like, don't, don't go down there. Only yesterday, a local lady was killed by a pack of wolves. Um, but weirdly enough, those next two days, once we waved goodbye to the, to, to the group of Tibetans, we were followed by a pack of wolves for two days. But we weren't able to link the two together because we didn't know what he was saying. It was only six months later that we, boom. So, you know, those wolves following us potentially were the same pack that killed that lady. Um, so yeah, it only hit me the it's six months later. Yeah, so I'm kind of glad I didn't know at the time because that would have been freaky if I if I knew that they had killed a lady and then all of a sudden we'd be followed. Um, that would have been pretty creepy, especially at that point there weren't so many locals that we could shelter up with. We were just out there in the mountains. I felt very vulnerable. It was the west side of China. I felt probably even more vulnerable than I did in Mongolia alone. You know, it was something that I think because of the bears as well. The bears were a threat, man. Now, the bears I was scared of, they, you know, I, not at first. I went out there with a healthy mindset, sort of, you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. But it's just not realistic, that is. I get, I get the sense, um, but the locals just kept telling me otherwise. And I always say the best knowledge is local knowledge. And the photos and videos that they were showing me were pretty scary, pretty horrific. Um, to a point that I would, you know, ask them not to send me any more photos and videos, or, you know, stop, stop showing me this. And, you know, I'm already a, a very fearful. I don't need to see some guy being attacked by a bear or just stories like one guy that we stayed with uh, in his hut. He was in the middle of nowhere, just like typical alpine sort of um, pine trees and rocky mountains. And he's saying that a bear walked past his Tibetan mastiff that was staked in the ground. And these are big furry dogs. They fight off snow leopards, wolves, and can scare away bears sometimes. Well, this bear was so hungry, it walked straight past his, his Tibetan mastiff into his courtyard and was scratching at his steel door. And I was like, you were joking. Because he was trying to, well, he gave me a knife. I'm like, what's a knife going to do against this bear? But I appreciate it. And I said, what did you do? And he says, I, I hid in the cupboard. I closed myself in the cupboard and I just waited until I couldn't hear any more scratches. And I'm like, and I am out in the wilderness in a tent, you know, and it's scratching down steel doors. What, what use is a tent? And so there was all of this. Um, and that's why I did try to get up, up, out and off the mountains. There was that excitement when I dropped from Sichuan province into Yunnan province, which Yunnan is more tropical, more, Typical Asian sort of like Myanmar or Thailand, you've got your palm trees, you've got more vegetation, you're lower in altitude, it's warmer. And so I was very excited when I reached Yunnan province, knew, knowing that I don't need to watch my back as much, you know, it's just sort of the, the dogs that I needed to watch out for more. Um, and more the snakes and the spiders, I was sort of trading the bears and the wolves for the snakes and the spiders. But um, yeah, man, it was, it was worrying. But, you know, again, another challenge was the people that joined me. You can train for yourself, you can prepare for yourself, um, but you can't train and prepare for other people. So I did realize that I was being set by quite a lot by other people trying to join. And I was sort of open. They'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm ex-military. I'll be able to join you. And I don't even question that. I'm like, yeah, it'll be great. We'll have banter. We can talk. We can walk. And they would join me. But then they would start struggling. They've not put in the training. They don't have mm. the same motive, the same reason. 
Um, and then I had to try to then get them evacuated and that would affect my mindset because like a UK photographer joined me, he was supposed to join two weeks. He lasted six hours on day number one before he had to go home. Um, and then that on my mindset is just like, wow, I've got two weeks over these mountains completely solo again. Um, so that was quite difficult. I think we have we, 10 people of the 16 different guides and film crew that joined me on different um, at different locations we, we were evacuated. I had to abandon 10, 16 for four, four months, really. So that was insane. So you, you faced, you, you had the imminent threat of death almost with, with the things you were facing. Did you face any problems from military government that could have jeopardized the, the entire mission at all? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we did. But again, with this one, it was proper preparation, I would say. We, I had such solid teams in China. Um, you know, hence why it took such a long time, over two years to plan. Uh, so, you know, just for example, I had to, I had to um, become ambassador for the Green Development Foundation. But in order to come, become ambassador, they had to verify me as a temporary doctor for the year. Don't know if I should be saying this, a temporary doctor to get ambassadorship. Mm. Um, and only with that ambassadorship, I needed that in order to get access to the government. And now that I've got the doctor for the ambassador and the ambassador gets me access to the government, the government then stamps and gives me a signature saying that I can discuss and liaise directly with the authorities of the province that I'm walking through. So now I'm able to discuss the authorities and talk about the kit that I'm carrying because satellite systems, especially in China, are super sensitive. So they had to check the satellite and write notes down on pieces of paper. And pretty much I had to go through 14 different organizations like that. Um, I carry all of these documents, A4, you know, laminated yeah. in my rucksack. Uh, when I was captured by the police, which I was five different times, uh, I would have to present these documents. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes they would want to question me. Sometimes they took me out of the wilderness and they would take me to the government offices four hour drive away just in the middle of tibet um and question me you know and then i'd have to liaise between my team for translation and them and they would take me back uh one of the guys demanded that i delete all evidence that i was in this region so he demanded that i delete everything from my tracking system um so i had to make a phone call and i told him that i was phoning someone to ask how i can delete this but i wasn't i was phoning my web developer uh, John Davis to ask him to make sure it's all backed up before I delete it. <laughs> they were none the wiser, and he said, "Mate, you're good to go. I've backed it up three times." And then I showed them I deleted it. They allowed me to continue. Uh, another another uh, section. The police found me, which was crazy because I was allowed to be there, but and I had all the documents and visas and you know permits, and I was mm. I was allowed to be there. But they were just uncertain and they were unsure, and they were also worried for my safety because it was dangerous up there. Um, but this particular um, few officers, when they had, were done with me and they went to drop me back at the same location, they actually took me to the, to the bridge 40 miles back on, on myself to cross the bridge. And they said, stay on that side of the river. They were trying to say that this side is Tibet, that side is Qinghai, which is not, it's all Qinghai, but they're a little bit um, confused and they're all, it, it's very controversial, it's very sensitive. Um, but they dropped me to that bridge. I crossed to the other side and I had to redo all of those 40 miles again by foot, um, which took me another two days and it was across brutal terrain. So that set me back again. So I'd say 4,000 miles, but maybe it was probably just over with all of these hiccups and disruptions. Uh, but yeah, there were sensitivities. But again, with the right team, with the right preparation, um, I would have been deported easily if it, if I didn't have the right team and the right documents and, and done it the proper way. And that's why I say that probably the Yangtze River, out of all of the rivers of the world, I do believe that the Yangtze is the hardest one logistically. Maybe not physically, like the Amazon or the Nile, I don't know. But when it comes to sensitivities, they're just not corrupt. You can't buy yourself a visa. You've got to go the proper way. And they don't care who you are. You could be Brad Pitt. They'll still deport you. So um, very sensitive, very sensitive. And with all, with all the hiccups and everything included, how many days did this mission take in the end? That took um, 352 days altogether. But again, this wasn't, 
like if I was doing just walking, walking every day, then I could have smashed it in well below, below that. It wasn't a speed record anyways yeah. at first. But, um, you know, because there was such big demands in terms of I was looking to make it one of the world's most interactive, so I need to take time out to live stream, to document, to uh, post, to set up blogs. We were also filming for an international documentary, which I'm actually, this evening, I'm going to be watching the final version of the... Oh, wow. Yeah, which is exciting. You know, the team has sent it across and can't share it, but you watch it. And uh, so, yeah, can't wait for that. And we should find out within the next few months. Um, well, I do know channels, but I can't say until the contract is signed. So, yeah, I was filming for a documentary. Um, I w and that also meant that, you know, when people are watching a documentary, they don't just want to see one man trekking, one man and his mission. You know, they want to see the people of the country, the culture, the food, the, the different traditions that goes on, the diversity, the beauty The you know, also I was crossing different cities because on the Yangtze Riverbank, the first six months was sort of quite wild. The second six months was very urban. And so some of these cities are very historic. So I was again, taking some weeks out to really document with the team. The team would fly out, we wouldn't walk and we would capture everything we could. We were doing promotions. My book is translated into, into Mandarin over there. So we were doing book signings. We were doing talks. I was joined by members of public. We would partner up with WWF and different environmentalists. There was Chinese celebrities joining and they would live stream to like 1.3 million people and hold them for seven hours straight. It was crazy. There was a shoot for Adidas um, and a movie start for GQ. And me and this movie star were launching uh, Jet Li's clothing range. Um, you know, Jet Li, the movie star. So it was just madness, you know, it's like, what? Um, so it was a little bit of everything crammed in. So that's probably why it took really 352 days because it mm. wasn't just walking. It was just so many events and environmental work and documentary producing. And yeah. <laughs> one of the one of the questions I, I I've asked a few people on this show in the last few weeks I've um I interviewed a few guys from the the TV show over here called SAS Who Days Wins I don't know if you've heard of that but um, yes uh, who, who those guys which guy was that they interviewed I uh, well, I, the three of them I've done Mark Ollie Ollerton and Jay the newest one and uh, God, they're yes, all yes. ex special forces guys and. Mm. Um, I ask him this question, but I, I'll ask it to you because I think you might even be able to speak on it um, just as powerfully. Is willpower uh, a finite resource or do you think that we kid ourselves in terms of how much we have? Uh, would el elaborate, el explain that so, deeper. There's theories in some personal development books that you have a set amount of willpower so each person mm. has their own set amount. You can only go a, a, a certain amount. And once you run out of it, you run about it. You can't go anymore. But a lot of the guys I spoke to, the, person, uh, the SAS guys say that there's that block of what you think your willpower is. And that's where mm. most people cut it off. But there's actually more to it than, than we, the one we think we possess. Yeah, yeah. So more like persistence as well, how far yeah. you can go. Yeah, no, I'd say we definitely all, you know, and that's one thing I've learned on my journeys is that we are far more capable than we give ourselves credit for. Mm. With, all, with most of these expeditions, especially with Mongolia, I had so many people tell me it's just impossible. Um, and I could have listened to them. And maybe most people would, maybe that fear would sink in because these were the professionals. I wasn't a pro, I was just a scuba diver. Um, and they were the pros telling me that they've crossed Mongolia on horseback and it's just not possible to walk. And so I, I believe that you have got, you know, the willpower. It's not just, um, it's not just the physically how far you can go. I do believe we are closed and locked off mentally as well. Um, and I just realized when I was out there, because I was visualizing worst case scenario, when I was out there, my body was pushing through the limit of what my mind thought my body could go to, if that makes sense. Mm. I was in fear. I didn't know if I could push on, if I suffered with dehydration and how many days could I go on my last remaining dribbles of water. So I do believe we are far more capable than we give ourselves credit for. But I think other people test themselves more. Um, it's like the survival instinct. I believe we all have it, but I believe it's blunt on a lot of people. It's not sharpened or it's gathered up a layer of dust. We, but under that dust, we do all have that extra willpower, that extra persistence, that extra motive and reason, um, and instinct to be able to push on, to survive, or to achieve what you're aiming for. 
uh, for sure. And that's what I've learned is, um, yeah, and you don't find out unless you try. You could sit back and think, I can't do that. I can't do this. You just don't know. You just don't know until you give it a go, you know? Yeah. In, in terms of in goal setting, and you're someone who mm. set audacious goals and, you, and you're fixated on those goals. Um, a question I have, and I'll relate this to myself, for example. So mm-hmm. say that my ultimate goal is to, you know, be the number one education podcast in the UK, for example. And mm. that's the top of my mountain and I'm starting down here. And along the way, I'm hitting all these little milestones that are, that are massive to me. Maybe the, the first time I interviewed someone I was a big fan of, or mm. the first time I hit a certain amount of downloads, for example. But yeah. I found myself, I was so fixated on the, the main goal that I almost forgot to enjoy those milestones along the way. Do you yeah. think it's important to, to stop and enjoy the, the view and the process? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I do get carried away sometimes with that as well. Sometimes I'll be so focused on achieving that end goal that often the, the key lessons in the main development stage, which is the process can be overlooked. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from each milestone. And I think each milestone should be a celebration and uh, not just a stepping stone, not just, yes, I've achieved that. Let's get on to the next give yourself credit don't rest of course don't be like yeah you know i've done it i've reached that milestone don't dwell on it boom go to the next one but be proud that you reached that milestone um and again that's the same with the plan planning stage on a lot of people are are saying that sometimes they over plan and that puts them off sometimes they're they're planning so many milestones and they're working um, so hard to achieve the milestones that it is just hard work. They put so many planning, um, so much preparation that they're not really enjoying it. And I do believe you can over prepare and over plan as well. Um, you know, there's that Vietnam cycle I use for an example. Sometimes you've just got to, got to go. Uh, sometimes you just got to do it. But no, I do believe that with your cases, yeah, you've got to try to enjoy the milestones because they're all lessons they're all stories they're all unique experiences um yeah yeah for sure and, and often i don't know a, a good one like with mission yangtze it's it's weird this is always a weird one that's difficult to explain but it's almost i i did enjoy the whole process but i visualized that end goal so much that when i reached it I wasn't, yes, I've reached my final goal. It was like, it's about damn time, you know, after 352 days, after facing this, after facing that, I over-visualized, I overplayed it in my head so much that when I, when I did achieve it, I was just like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing, no emotion, no nothing, just like, cool. Because sometimes you work so hard to achieve it, don't you? Um, that when you do it. But I also believe that is good confidence as well. Once you finally achieve that goal, and there is no celebrating is because you never doubted yourself the second that you wouldn't get there. So that's also what I would recommend, you know, yeah. is enjoy the process. But when you're there, you'll probably find that you worked so hard to get there that it's a stamp, a statement of, yeah, yeah, of course I'm the number one most educational podcast in the UK. Have you not seen who I've interviewed type of thing? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So once you, you know, once you finally get there, which you will, um, it will be. It will just be through hard work, and you won't see it as a big deal. Yeah, I um, I have three more questions for you if we've got time. Um, sure. You've obviously taken on uh, that sense of adventure in the the highest way possible, but if we scale it down and make it relative to normal people, um, mm. how important do you think that building that sense of adventure into your life is, even if it's on a, a really small scale? Say someone going to climb Penavan, for example? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's, um, I think it's a must. And, you know, adventure doesn't have to be just in adventure terms for physical attributes. Advent- mm. You can have an adventurous career working yourself up at the ladder of being, I don't know, a financial advisor or whatever it might be. Um, you know, doing a university degree can be your own adventure as well. Because an adventure, I think, is something that, pushes you out of your comfort zone and you're not 100 percent how you're going to get to the uh, to the end goal and you know you could go around you could go through you could go over you could go under um it could be finance it could be corporate world it could be the education world or it could be the adventure world i think we all do have our own adventures in life um however small big or different they are 
adventure is adventure and I do believe we're all we're all living our own story our own life um, and that's why I like to talk about these stories in terms of you know I don't share these stories in the hope that someone will also pick up the machete and hack their way through a jungle you know it's unlikely that that will happen that's always there if they want but I share it in a way that is relatable you know because at the end of the day we're all facing our own kind of jungle we're all sort of navigating our own Gobi Desert um, and in terms of what I, when I say breaking the goals out in 100 meter sections, that could be breaking your goals down in, in terms of smashing up these essays before you go mm. for the main exam or, or you're looking to get to the top of the ladder in this industry, but you've got to take it step by step to climb that ladder to be at the top corporate CEO level. Um, so yeah, I do, I do say that it's important to goal set. It's important to take on adventures. Um, and yeah, just keep keep going, and I, that's why I try to do it in a relatable way, you know. Yeah, and you've uh, you've written your own book, Mission Possible. Um, that's <laughs> undoubtedly going to or have affected and impacted so many people who have read it. Are there any books that that you've read that have impacted you in, in your life in any way? Um, I'm reading Sapien at the minute. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm not long so long started that. But I love that. I love like rolling it back to the history of how, where we came from, how it all began. Mm. Uh, another one that I really liked was The Law of Attraction, mm. uh, The Secret. Have you ever heard of that or read yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Bob Proctor and, and Co. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome as well, you know, because I've always sort of used visualization techniques. I never knew about The Secret when I was 16. Never knew yeah. about a dream board. I just had sort of a map, the quotes, the pictures to help myself keep focused but uh, i can resonate a lot with with that um so i would say those two are, are big ones that i really enjoy but i'm not really a much of a book reader to be honest which is crazy how i've got a book but i don't read much <laughs> <laughs> um i guess another way of, of consuming similar content is through podcasts and um speaking of which mm. I, I remember in january when i when i first listened to you on the joe rogan podcast and um mm. Now I have the chance to say I thank you for 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 mentioning Wales on that podcast because I've yeah, no. I've I've listened to that podcast since I was a young teenager and there's only ever been yeah. before you there was one guy who was technically Welsh but he identified as British and uh, he never yeah. mentioned he never mentioned Wales it was John Ronson uh, and when John, you come on the first thing you did was pull up the pictures of the, the flag, give him the Welsh dragon. It was good. <laughs> yeah, that's ace. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I brought him that little Welsh dragon in as well. I saw that on a few of his podcasts recently. He's still there in the middle of his, uh, in, of his desk. But um, yeah, that's it, you know. And the support has mainly been from England. There's not been much support on my adventurous career from, from Wales, which is a shame. But again, you can't really ignore where you come from and uh, you've got to be proud of where you where you come from for sure so no it was nice to it was cool that jamie actually pulled it up on the big screen yeah. as well wasn't it that's <laughs> a wicked one um the last question i have for you then is um sort of a scenario so we've talked a lot about life lessons and and um messages but if you were to mm. sort of distill your life lessons down and you were given the opportunity to broadcast one lesson one short sharp message to everyone in the world what would you want them to hear? Um, I would say that whatever, whatever vision or goal or dream you're working towards or have, stop at nothing. Understand there will be great difficulties. Um, and most importantly is because we're all re always relying on friends' advice, distant people's advice, family advice, is it doesn't matter if no one else sees it for you. You know, what's important is if you see it for yourself and understand that on that journey that you can't always be motivated, but you can be disciplined. Where can the listeners connect with you on social media? And I would say Instagram is probably the most popular one for uh, regular updates. So uh, Instagram, get more into the YouTube and then the website, which has the book, which is just ashdykes.com. Perfect, man. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. I hope you Same, have too. Same, likewise. It's been great.